lives together. There is a hope that burns within my heart that gives me strength. Dear friends, today is the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. The readings appointed for the day are from Proper 8, Track 1. There are Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 to 14, Psalm 13, Romans chapter 6, verse 12 through 23, and St. Matthew chapter 10, verse 40 through to verse 42. I'll pray the collect for the day, and after which I'll read the gospel appointed for today. This will be followed by meditation from Father Garfield, and we will close with the hymn, There's a Fountain Filled with Blood, by Graham Kendrick. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teachings, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 40. Jesus said, Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The word of the Lord. My brothers and sisters, I speak to you in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our reflection for today is guided by Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 through 14. The story of Abraham attempting to kill his son Isaac as an offering of obedience to God is a very troubling one for us contemporary readers. The challenge the text poses for most of us is due to our heightened 21st century sensibilities about care and protection of our children. As we read the text, our eyes and hearts see and feel a scandalous behavior of brutish proportions wherein Abraham is seeking to murder an innocent child in a puerile effort to show that he is totally obedient to God. And then there are some of us who accept what Abraham did and was going to do because it is written in the Bible and it says God commanded him to do it. But from what I have come to experience about God in Jesus Christ, I take the position of Mark Bazuti Jones in saying, God did not command Abraham to kill Isaac to show total obedience. 
I believe that Abraham believed that God instructed him to do it. But I do not believe that God commands us to commit such ghastly acts that violate the sanctity of life and destroy something good that is made in God's image in some effort to prove ourselves to God. I do not believe that God puts us to the test in those kinds of ways for us to prove ourselves to him as if God is some insecure human despot that requires us to do such actions. As Christians, we know that it is the grace of God in Jesus Christ that makes us worthy before God and not any feeble action that we can conjure up to prove our worthiness to God. Now having said this, the question that we might ask is why would this story be written and framed in the manner that it has? Because from us reading Jeremiah, we know that God was totally against child sacrifice that was not very uncommon at the time. Such act was detestable to Yahweh God and was one of the charges of sin that was levied against Judah. So, why then the sacrifice of Isaac as a feeble attempt to signify total obedience to Yahweh? While this story might upset our 21st century sensibilities and hyper-political correctness, the writers of Genesis are making a point more about God than they are about Abraham's ill-conceived plans. This story highlights three things, many things, but three that I would like to pick out. One, it highlights what God requires of us. Two, it highlights how God continuously saves us from our folly. And three, it highlights how God will provide a way for those who earnestly seek God. If we look at this story through our contemporary eyes, we will only see the dastardly act of Abraham, which has been and should rightly be frowned upon and resisted. But we have to understand that the book of Genesis is exilic and post-exilic literature. That is to say that it is heavily influenced by the events of the Babylonian exile. Much of the book was composed during the time that of exile in Babylon, which forced Judah to recast their identity as a Sabbath-keeping people of Yahweh God. It was written with a slant to show that Yahweh was the one true God, more powerful than any other gods of the day, despite the fact that Yahweh's people were enslaved by a more dominant people. Therefore, we find in Genesis the story of Yahweh creating the world ex nihilo, out of nothing. Yahweh also making the impossible happen by Abraham 99 and Sarah 90 conceiving and giving birth to a son. It is only Yahweh who can do such powerful things. And above all, it shows Yahweh's unyielding faithfulness despite the many doubts of Abraham. Yahweh is always faithful, no matter how unfaithful Abraham becomes. In a sense, it is casting a picture for the people of Judah that regardless of what might be their circumstances, it was not Yahweh's doing, it was the people's doing because of their lack of trust and obedience to Yahweh. That is where we see in Genesis that every time that Abraham doubted God and did something contrary to the promise that God made to him, it turned to chaos. But despite the chaos, Yahweh still worked his promise out and remained faithful to Abraham. It is representative 
of Yahweh's commitment to the people of Judah, despite their hardness of heart. This chapter 21, which is our text for today, is more than likely written post-exile when the people were rest resettling in the land of Judah. Many of them were actually born in Babylon and had never seen the land of Judah before. A story like this one would serve as a reminder to them that they should remain obedient to Yahweh to avoid another exile like that of the Babylonian exile. Therefore, they should not place anything before Yahweh because Yahweh requires total obedience and trust from his people. Anything other than that would lead to possibly more destruction and even exile again. Because the story, you see, is set against the backdrop of each time Abraham and Sarah were unfaithful to Yahweh, something bad happened. This story also highlights the point that once they remained obedient to Yahweh, he would deliver them from evil. Nevertheless, Yahweh their provider will act regardless of the people's action. So, before Abraham could kill Isaac to show obedience, <laughs> Yahweh stopped him. Because Yahweh does not require such things as a show of obedience, but Yahweh saw that the heart was in the right place, but being manifested in the wrong way. Therefore, Yahweh looked upon Abraham with mercy and not judgment. Finally, after Yahweh stopped Abraham and looked upon him with mercy, Yahweh provided a ram for the sacrifice. The point then is that Yahweh, while he requires obedience, is also merciful and will come to the aid of his people because that is Yahweh's very heart. This reflects very much of what we see in God in Jesus the Christ. We have a God who lays it all on the line for us. For while God requires of us a response of love which leads to obedience, he does not require any of us to prove ourselves to him. We cannot get around the fact that obedience to God and the will of God is required of each of us because, to put it semi-flippantly, it makes life less difficult for God and easier for us. For when we disobey God, it leads to a whole lot of mess that God has to then clean up on our behalf. If obedience to God in Christ becomes the first way for us, then much of the sacrifice that we seek to make will be unnecessary because the one and only sacrifice that is required was already made by God who gave up Jesus to the death of a cross. So there is no real sacrifice we can make. Whatever sacrifice we believe that we are making to show God that we love him is more for us than it is for God. God requires obedience, not sacrifice. So whatever we choose to give up in our quest to serve God is in our best interest, not God's interest. Obedience to God leads us into life, making life on this earth more worthwhile. If we want life to be better for us and for those around us, let us be obedient to the will of God by loving God with all our heart and soul and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves, for that is what God commands us to do. Amen. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins And sinners plunged beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains
Then in I know 